And thank you for joining us today for our webinar on Relining Drainage Structures presented by Contec. Before we start today's webinar, we would like to cover a few housekeeping matters that will ensure we have a smooth presentation. We have placed all phones on mute to cut down on background noise and to ensure everyone can hear the presentation. At the conclusion of today's webinar, we will provide information on how to obtain PDRH certificates for today's presentation. The webinar is scheduled to last for one hour. We will have about 50 minutes of presentation followed by a question and answer period. When you logged on to the webinar, the GoToWebinar window will have appeared on the upper right-hand corner of your screen. This window will minimize by itself after a few seconds so that it does not interfere with you viewing the webinar. If you would like to minimize it, just click on the small red arrow and the window will be maximized. The blue box in the GoToWebinar window will allow you to minimize or maximize the presentation so you can view it in whatever size works best for you. If you have a question, please type your question into the question box and we will be taking questions throughout the webinar. Presenting today will be Hugh Mickle. Hugh is the Director of Reline Technologies at Contec. With Contec since 1985, he holds a BS degree in Civil Engineering from Purdue University and became a registered as a professional engineer in 1990. In 32 years with Contec, he has worked in the Great Lakes, Atlantic, and South Central region, as well as headquarters in Ohio. Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Hugh. Oh, thanks, Lisa. You know what, I, may, I uh, failed to advance those slides, Did, and you talked about these already, correct? Correct. My apologies. And uh, hi, folks. Uh, appreciate you taking the time today to learn a little bit about uh, the reline of drainage structures. And what we will talk about today really is, is much, uh, very much applicable to sanitary sewer pipelines as well. Obviously, there are some other uh, characteristics that you have to deal with when doing a sanitary sewer project. Uh, so we're going to focus uh, on drainage structures. And the reason this is such a hot topic today in the civil engineering and construction infrastructure world is because of the aging infrastructure and the massive cost to rebuild it by open cut methods. Uh, just a couple of quick examples. This was a project, it was triple steel, 13-foot uh, diameter uh, culverts underneath I-95 in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And the ADT in Bridgeport, Connecticut at that time was in excess of 120,000 vehicles a day. There were, was substantial cover on these culverts, over 30 feet. And it was a brackish environment as well. And the steel pipes did quite well to last 45 years plus, but they needed... Uh, they needed full replacement or rehab. The DOT ended up lining them with aluminum structural plate and the hydraulics all worked out uh, to allow 12 foot diameter aluminum structural plate pipes to be slip lined through them and they estimated that the cost savings was in excess of four and a half million dollars uh, but uh, I've put three and a half million. Nonetheless it was a lot uh, to open cut 35 feet of an interstate highway with that kind of traffic uh, and MOT issues, you know, it would have just been a massive headache. On a smaller scale, it's just not large-scale DOT jobs with huge ADTs. Uh, county and municipal markets and even private structures uh, can also benefit from these techniques. In this example, the replacement cost for new 12 by 12 concrete boxes was $379,000 on a project in Missouri, and they ended up spending $41,000 for aluminized CMP and slip lining the existing cast in place boxes. So the cost savings can be huge, but again, the, the MOT issues, the maintenance of traffic issues that can be avoided are even potentially bigger. So by the end of today, the goal is to allow you to feel much more comfortable and confident in tackling a potential reline project. We're assuming that the audience is primarily civil consulting engineers, uh, municipal and county highway department folks and bridge department folks, and DOT personnel as infrastructure owners and owners representatives. Uh, we've targeted this group 
in recruiting you to to hear this message and again our our goal is to take a broadly generic view of this uh, and then elevate your confidence by the end of it uh, selfishly contact is very much involved with this we we manufacture 14 different reline or product families that can be used in reline applications you'll see some of those sprinkled through this presentations uh, this presentation but we uh, have set this up again to be generic and to apply to lots of different products and technologies that are out there so these are the things we're going to talk about uh, I've narrowed it down to seven critical design and construction considerations and all of these need to be thought through during the planning stage of a project or the scoping phase from a condition assessment uh, review hydraulics analysis structural design techniques material selection obviously is very important constructability is critical that can make or break a project and then perhaps the second highest risk item other than sizing and dealing with hydraulics uh, is grouting and finally we'll talk a little bit about plans and specifications and what should be in them we'll wrap up with a case study and then talk a little bit uh, broadly about uh, what resources are available and finally at the end we're going to open it up to questions I think we may have 12 to 15 minutes uh, of Q&A time so as we're moving along if you think of any questions please log them and Lisa will will pose those questions to me at the end from a condition assessment standpoint the key is you've got to get inside and see it when you're dealing with a structure and for for us by the way a structure means the pipeline or culvert or bridge structure uh, it's not the it's not the manhole or catch basin it's the actual pipeline structure so you've got to get in and see what's going on and of course you have to recognize what it is uh, upper left is slabbing that has occurred in a reinforced concrete elliptical pipe upper right and that's a significant issue of course upper right looks pretty ugly but it might not be it's just a rusting of the lower cage or reseal in a, in a cast in place box lower left is a another RCP pipe uh, but there are some strange things going on you can see the flow but you can also see that there is infiltration through the joints uh, and the timing of this photo would be very important to know if that was from a groundwater surcharge or if that's a constant thing and in the lower right I don't know if you can see my arrow but there's a, a squiggly darker line in the corroded zone and we saw that in a video a grainy video uh, years ago ahead of the a reline opportunity and it was a great concern as we got inside it and looked at it more closely it was a full corrosion failure of the mul of the uh, steel wall at that level and what I'm doing in that photo there is is digging down to the invert I wanted to see uh, try to gauge whether that, that sediment was a long-term buildup or whether that occurred more recently and and therefore what the condition of the invert was the bottom line is whether you're dealing with pipe wall issues it's easy to see some things from the end but you can't always do that you've got to get inside and take a look at joints and and uh, inlets and uh, drainage uh, tie-ins and uh, of course the pipe wall all the way through oftentimes as you all are much more aware of than me uh, it's uh, it doesn't come to a head until there's something that happens on the surface and that's very unfortunate I'm a big proponent of inventorying all culverts and storm sewers that are 48 inch on up uh, or anything under significant fill or anything under significant uh, traffic uh, volumes and watching those things uh, to keep an eye such that you don't have a sinkhole that develops or or a total washout that develops these things can kill people and uh, it's our responsible responsibility collectively to look at these things ahead of time to try to prevent them also you've got to <clears throat> research the background and history of a structure uh, in this case this was a 1930s 
a pipe that had been installed for a, a creek enclosure. And we learned that very early on additional fill was placed. And so it was under designed and the pipe reacted by cracking the top and bottom. And about 30 years into its age, the owner poured a concrete invert in it. Uh, the steel banding that you see here is what the reline contractor did ahead of a of a relining project to provide some tensile reinforcement across that crown uh, area <clears throat> to make it a safe working environment. Once again, you've got to get inside and look at it, and you've got to <clears throat> excuse me, you've got to understand what you're seeing. On the left, this is a bituminous coated corrugated metal pipe arch and it's a, actually a prime candidate for a paved invert or a spray-on lining <clears throat> because most of the metal uh, in the invert is still there. The, the bituminous coating is gone, the galvanizing is gone closer toward the invert, but there's not a lot of base metal loss there yet. So now is the time to put a paved invert in it and you can turn this into a 100-year structure. On the right, this would be a very challenging project to do with, a, with either a spray-on lining or a concrete paved invert because of the total metal loss. Uh, so those decisions have to be made as well. We often get asked if inverts can be replaced in, the, in multiplates or uh, what the best approach is for a concrete paved invert. And I always defer people to Caltrans. They have published a document uh, it's DIB 83, where they review a lot of reline technologies that are out there, but they have a terrific approach to designing paved inverts. And fundamental in that approach is that the new paved invert picks up the wall thrust that is carried in the hose pipe and transferred into that uh, partial lower arc that becomes a compression arc. Uh, it's a really smart way to do it, and you can find out more information from that document. So beyond assessment, the biggest decision is hydraulics. And usually, hydraulics governs in a reline decision, and it becomes a matter of what will fit and still meet the hydraulic criteria. Uh, oftentimes, regulatory agencies and, let's just say, less sophisticated uh, engineers might say that the goal is to just line it with something as big as you can and make it as smooth as you can so it optimizes the hydraulics. And that, that really is a, an incomplete statement uh, or an incomplete approach. You, you have to run the hydraulics uh, in every situation. And the reason is many culverts operate in inlet control hydraulically. And a typical uh, section of what that looks like is shown here, where the, the roughness and the length and the slope of the culvert don't matter. It's simply a matter of the waterway area at the inlet and the inlet condition, in this case a projected, projecting sharp-edged inlet. And that's extremely common, of course, for corrugated metal pipes that are in the inventory. So in this situation, Smoothness doesn't matter. It's a matter of improving the inlet and optimizing the area. The hydraulics programs that are available also look at outlet control, and this is what it can look like, where either the, t the uh, downstream end is submerged or there's a headwater or a tailwater situation with the water surface that uh, causes the pipe to flow full. And in those situations, roughness, slope, length, et cetera, and of course, in the condition and area all matter. And so that's where a, a smooth liner uh, can help quite a bit. But you've got to evaluate both. And uh, I was a civil graduate from Purdue with a bachelor's degree. I had one hydraulics class, and we did not talk about inlet control and outlet control. I didn't learn about that until I got out in the, in the working world. Oh. What happened? Sorry about that. So you've got to look at both. A great hydraulic analysis software program is available for free, and the current version is 7.50, I believe, but it's an FHWA-generated program. It's maintained by them as well through the McTrans 
Center at Florida, University of Florida, and you can download it for free. And it evaluates inlet control and outlet control. You, you run it all. If you set it up correctly, it shows you the headwater depth in both scenarios, and then you know how it's operating. One of the ways you can deal with a smaller area is by improving the inlet. And in this photograph, uh, that's actually a contact sales engineer in, the, in New England. And he's very proud of the fact that he knows to recommend an inlet uh, that is improved. And in this case, with a head wall and a beveled edge, that takes the inlet loss coefficient down to 0 0.2 versus 0 0.9 in the case of this projecting edge before they improved it and lined it. So that's an, a very important uh, challenge on any reline uh, project is the hydraulics. From there, if you come up with a structure size that works and meets the hydraulic situation, uh, then you move to structural design. We are big fans of, of following ASHTO design methodologies. Uh, some ASTM methodologies are pretty solid and some are incomplete in my view. Uh, but once a product and a design standard gets ASHTO inclusion, then it's been through a great deal of scrutiny. And those guys, uh, the bridge engineers, are the ones who uh, cover all pipe-related items in their LRFD standard specification for highway bridges. And it covers small diameter plastic pipes uh, all the way up to precast arches and boxes uh, and everything in between. And that document is phenomenal. And that group is quite active. They're extremely talented and knowledgeable. and once you get inclusion in there, then a product has met all great scrutiny and is, is uh, absolutely solid. Uh, by the way, uh, we, uh, we strongly encourage you to take the design approach that base, uh, basically assumes the new structure carries the full load. That can be in conservative in uh, some situations. The only ASHTO stand, uh, design standard that allows for a less than full high to cover uh, design load is the tunnel liner plate design method. And that can be half to two thirds of the load or so. Uh, but, uh, and perhaps that applies in some reline situations, but where you have open joints or uh, inverts that are badly corroded and material is moving around and uh, of course when uh, the host pipe can potentially move from shifting ground conditions or reconsolidation of materials around the outside of it, it really is an active load situation and, and short of investigating that very fully which could be very costly, uh, a smart approach is just to design it based on uh, carrying the full load. So next is material selection. This is a listing of reline materials that are very common in the U.S. Uh, the ones in red are those that we do not uh, manufacture or participate in, uh, but they're all very solid approaches when done correctly and applied correctly. Um, segmental slip line products are extremely cost effective. That's typically the most cost effective approach to a reline project. Uh, but when access is limited, there are other approaches, uh, approaches that are viable, uh, depending on whether you have to use a, uh, an insertion pit or just run through the manholes. When you are limited to just manhole entry, the, limits, the uh, options become more limited. The spiral wound uh, option is good, but that typically is just a round structure. Um, Spray on linings and CIPP can also go through uh, manholes. Uh, they have some design uh, limitations um, and, and require bypass pumping. Uh, the spiral wound does not. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But this is a listing of, of uh, material options. I want to point out uh, something, and, and that is, you know, we've, we've been a manufacturer of CMP. Uh, since it was invented, nearly since it was invented in 1896. Um, it started as an, an association of those groups and then we provided uh, Arm, uh, Armco ingot iron sheets and eventually we bought many of those folks and 
uh, formed the old Armco Metal Products Division, and then we became Contech. But new CMP that we sell today oftentimes is of a much different grade than the galvanized CMP that, that uh, was used for many, many decades or the bituminous coated option. Aluminized is much more durable. It's typically three times more durable, and we know a lot about what it will do and where. That started in the 50s, that, that baseline of knowledge, and Caltrans did it. They looked at 7,000 culverts in their system and did water sampling, and they took uh, invert measurements to determine metal loss. Uh, they also made notations about the flow and uh, flow characteristics. And what that did is generate this. And basically, if you know the pH and resistivity of the effluent at, at low flow, so it's typical, and you know some uh, velocity characteristics of the flow and how abrasive it is, you can predict the service life of these structures quite accurately. And it's based on galvanized. You can then uh, extrapolate it to aluminize based on the research information that is available. Really, we haven't learned anything new since about 1991 when this document was published, uh, but we've compiled all the decades of CMP performance uh, characteristics and knowledge into two pages in this CMP design guide. And basically you have to know the water chemistry, which is, is a very inexpensive test, uh, and you have to know the abrasion level. FHWA d defines four abrasion levels. They're based on a two-year flow velocity and the propensity to have bed load in it, which is sand, grit, gravel, that kind of thing flowing through it. From there, you can select a material that will last up to 100 years. So I would encourage you to use us as a resource. We have 120 plus uh, folks in the field, and they can tap into the knowledge base that we have uh, internally, and we can help you assess structures. I would also encourage you to look at the water chemistry. The little uh, whatever you call that, the meter that is shown in this photo. I actually took a photo of the one that I have. It's 150 bucks from coalparmer.com. And you can buy that and it gives you pH and conductivity, which is the inverse of resistivity. So those two characteristics and then the two-year velocity gives you a really good feel for predicting metal pipe uh, service life. You, Again, can I interrupt for a second? Yes. Um, I've had more than one question regarding that Caltrans document from slide 13 or 14. What was the name of the Caltrans document? Um, it was a little a few minutes earlier in the presentation, probably about five minutes ago. Oh, that showed the uh, paved invert information? I think so. Did you say 83BE? Yes. D like dog, I, B like boy, 83. Mm -hmm. DIB yeah. 83. 83. And okay. if you um, search that online, you can download a PDF copy of it. Okay, great. Um, I just wanted to get that answered because there were multiple questions coming up on that document. So I just okay, wanted to get no that answered before you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for doing that. Uh, we, we believe there were over a thousand registrants for this presentation. So uh, again, Lisa, if you get uh, a bunch of questions, no need to save them till the end uh, on the same topic. So there are smooth versions of CMP in polymer and aluminized and aluminum. We're going to move on through this. This is what the ultraflow or spiral rib uh, corrugation look like, looks like. That's the generic name. It offers a Manning Xana .012. And then we move to thermoplastic pipes. We, there are a number of PVC options out there. There is also a solid wall HDPE version. You can fusion weld it or you can use a, a basically a, a snapped together mechanical joint. And that product that we rep is called SnapTight. Uh, their website is very good for uh, culvert reline information. It's culvertrehab.com. Uh, but if you just search for SnapTight, that will find it as well. We manufacture a steel-reinforced high-density polyethylene pipe product called Duramax. 
and it has full AASHTO inclusion in their uh, installation standard and their uh, design standard. Um, it's available through 120 inch diameter and we make it down to 30 inch. It takes all the great advantages of HDPE uh, but combines it with the load carrying capability of steel and it's an 80 KSI steel uh, rib system that actually carries the load per the AASHTO folks. We make a spiral wound version of that product as well. Uh, all the equipment that you see in the upper right hand corner can be fed through a 22 inch diameter manhole lid. Uh, it's always quicker if you can take the frame and cover off, uh, but you don't necessarily need to take the manhole cap or the cone section off. But that product is designed much like a direct berry product, but it can be manufactured down inside of an access chamber or manhole. The project that is shown here, the lower left hand photo, uh, I took that photo while they were manufacturing the product and you can do it under flow with up to 30 percent of the flow depth in it. Uh, so it's a pretty slick pro uh, product. It's not cheaper than uh, segmental slip lining with Duramax uh, normally, but if you have limited access points you can't get into the ends or an insertion pit isn't economical for whatever reason. This is a great approach. So this was the, the most recent uh, project and I presented a paper at NoDig last week in DC on this project. It was lining a 72 inch RCP with SPRPE and it creates a jointless system that, that carries the full load. You grout the space in between them and it was all done. Uh, the footprint for manufacturer looks like that lower hand, left hand corner. Uh, you have a container with monitoring equipment and control and power supply equipment. You have to have a generator on site. The profile comes in a spool, which is what you see over here. And then the equipment is supported by this A-frame. It's pretty slick. Aluminum structural plate is a workhorse on reline projects. It's extremely durable. It's full aluminum alloy, marine grade aluminum alloy through its cross section. Um, it's been around since the mid 60s and we even have some structures that have been in seawater environments up along the northern main coast uh, since the mid 60s that are still performing extremely well and it's very lightweight which is a wonderful thing uh, in reline applications. We make tunnel liner plate that can be used where you need to, to remine or do some hand tunneling work and uh, it also, in the case of the project shown, it can be built and provide a safe working environment as you uh, work your way through a damaged or deflected or failing culvert structure. Next, constructability. This is a list of things that you have to take a, a look at. Uh, safety of workers is always primarily uh, primary and job number one. Uh, access and economics is extremely important as well and of course viability so that means you have to look at traffic control right-of-way access in uh, access either through the ends or through manholes or insertion pits you have to look at bypass requirements or whether you can coffer dam flow temporarily to do what you need to do uh, all of that rolls up into constructability from a process standpoint there are two primary methods. One is the continuous push method. That is where you place and then make the joint with the second piece in your work area and then advance it forward, repeat, advance it forward, and you end up basically pushing a train of reline pipe uh, through the access uh, location. Another one is individual segment method. On bigger structures, and we've done some that are 45 feet long and 10 foot diameter pipe, uh, but this can be done where you push the pipe segment through to its end location. The advantage there is you can block, partially block it as you go, and you don't need significant equipment if the pipe material is light enough. So it can be advanced sometimes by hand, sometimes with a small hand driven cable winch. Uh, that process 
uh, can be repeated. The uh, access to the joint locations, which allows for blocking, is, is a benefit. And then, of course, this starts the process or the conversation around grouting. In this photo, you see vertical braces that are running up through a 12 o'clock grout port, and then they distribute the uplift load to those vertical braces through a floor beam. And that is, uh, we'll talk more about that later, uh, but that's a very important part of the grouting process. This is a picture that shows the final grout lift through a 12 o'clock port. And when PVC ball valves came out in the early 2000s, that was a wonderful thing in the reline world because you no longer had to spend 60 bucks on a brass ball valve for all these locations. You could spend six or seven dollars. Uh, so that's a wonderful thing. Normally, grouting occurs through, oops, through the 12, through the grout ports that are in the wall. There are other methods as well that run grout, tr grout tubes through the void space on top or on the, uh, around the crown and place that grout at strategic locations. That is all uh, contractor choice in our view. Uh, they are the experts on grouting and we support them by making sure they know what buoyant forces are all about. This is a depiction of a, a grouting method from the end. It's going to be three lifts. The first lift will, will be placed from the lower grout ports and allowed to set up, not achieve high strength, but uh, to achieve initial set before the second lift occurs, which will run up to this level, and then the third le lift can go all the way up. What we like to do with the contractors is a buoyancy uh, calculation and a grouting plan that balances each grouting lift so that you optimize the use of your hold down force. That can be water inside the new pipe, it can be dead weight, sandbags, pipelines filled with water, or it can be the beam and jack method that you saw uh, earlier. And uh, But one way or another you have to account for that. The only option is if you're allowed to float the new structure to the crown of the host pipe. Then buoyancy isn't necessarily con a concern, but you have to look at the crush strength of the pipe under those uplift loads. Cellular grout is, is, uh, has been around for a while, but the geographical uh, capability of cellular grout is now uh, fast growing and it can be found uh, in most locations. You can either uh, foam it in line with some reasonably priced equipment or you can foam it in your grout truck at right when it arrives to the site. But there are a couple of great advantages to cellular grout. Number one, it takes a heavy unit weight of grout down to a man much more manageable level so you reduce the uplift loads. Number two, in this case where you're taking it to 30 PCF, one cubic yard of normal concrete grout or cement-based grout can become 3.8 cubic yards of cellular grout. That's a wonderful thing. It pays for itself. So uh, one comment again on grouting, all of the Reline products that you've seen from us uh, use conventional grout or a cellular grout that is low strength. And if you run through the structural design and actually calculated what the new host pipe exerts on the grout and therefore to the soil envelope and the host structure that will remain there, it's pretty low, uh, a low level. At 20 feet of cover and 120 pound per cubic foot uh, dead load unit weight of your soil fill, it ends up being just 17 PSI of pressure that is exerted on the grout. So a 200 PSI cellular grout provides a huge safety factor. So we're not talking about high strength structural grouts when you're doing uh, structure reline. So plans and specification wise, this is uh, the key. Uh, shape information on the hose pipe is the key. If you have 3D laser profile information, that is uh, a wonderful thing for bidding contractors. At a minimum, you've got to have rise and span and uh, dimensioning information, and you need to tie that into elevations. 
you can't just have two dimensional shapes that are spaced every say 20 feet if you've got a bunch of up and down in your line it doesn't do you any good if you're trying to push a cylinder through it right um, this is a document that I'm starting to see all around the country we've been pushing this document out for about 15 years it was developed by an engineer for the Connecticut DOT on on that Bridgeport uh, reline project under I-95 and it, even to this day it's the best list of submittal documents that I've seen uh, what this does it allows the reline contractor some creativity to give you the most economical approach which is a great thing but it forces him to submit all this information so that you can make sure that he thinks about his approach and he knows what he's doing. He's got to give you a bulkhead design. He's got to show you buoyant force calculations. He's got to show you a mixed design and his volume, his schedule for the volume. All of these things combined let you evaluate whether he knows what he's doing and it can help make a project go very, very well. So a, a case study, and then we'll open it up to some questions. Uh, this was in Connecticut as well. Uh, the Connecticut DOT jumped on the reline uh, wagon in the in the 90s, and they've saved many, many tens of millions of dollars uh, doing this, and still satisfied the environmental folks and the hydraulic requirements on all these. Uh, this particular one was a steel pipe arch under I-91. It was built in 1964. It was open in the median, and we're looking at the headwalls there. Uh, so the, uh, the amount of cover, however, was 22 feet, and that is not a good thing. That was a poor design decision made by somebody uh, back in the, in the 60s. Pipe arches are made for shallow cover structures. Under high fill, they generate very high uh, pressures in the corners. So when this structure began corroding uh, and moving because of the invert corrosion, it concentrated that high pressure even more in the haunch areas and it began squatting down. This caused the invert to buckle upwards, uh, which is what you see here. So unfortunately, the DOT waited probably five to eight years too long before they address this. If they would have done it sooner, it would have been a much more simple and cost-effective uh, pipe arch reline. But as it were, as it was, um, the structure had a, a very unfortunate shape to it by the time they were able to reline it. So they did a 3D laser survey. This was uh, about a year and a half ago uh, to two years ago. Um, and 3D laser profiling was available. That is a phenomenal tool in the reline world, and it's becoming more and more cost effective as consult more consultants get it. Uh, but in this case, they set up in four locations at the both ends of each of the two lines, and it only took a matter of uh, an hour. I think he said it was two and a half hours. Uh, to get all the the readings and from that they generated a data file that was I think he told me hundred and sixty gigabytes of data and the software package allowed them to do cross sections and look at a new reline structure and and determine if it would fit so in the section that is on the bottom part of this slide the red is the original shape the black is is present day at this section, or was present day at the time. The blue was a new pipe arch shape that would work hydraulically and structurally, but as you can see, it wasn't going to fit. So what the DOT uh, decided to do, uh, we proposed an aluminum tunnel liner plate uh, pipe arch shape that would allow them to build up next to the crown or underneath the crown of the host pipe and then Exume, exhume portions of the invert as needed and build a safe working environment as you go. And in a nutshell, here's how the process worked. First thing they did was they braced the structure. You can see the blocking is set up right underneath the longitudinal bolts uh, in the haunch plates. 
and that locked in the structure. It, it protected their top arc that was in very good uh, condition. The verticals actually weren't necessary, but the contractor wanted to add those as well. Uh, as well. And then uh, we gave them a limit. Uh, we use an engineering firm out of Ohio that is extremely uh, talented and knowledgeable in this sort of thing. And we, uh, we cut through and looked at the backfill material. And once that was determined, we gave them a limit on what could be removed from the invert safely. Uh, and then they began using aluminum tunnel liner plate. Uh, the interesting thing with tunnel liner plate is you can place all the bolts and nuts internally. You don't have to get around on the outside. It was a product designed for hand tunneling, uh, but it makes for a good reline product as well. This is, and it's extremely lightweight. The plates weighed 23 pounds, yet they provide a beefy uh, section modulus uh, to be designed for the amount of fill that, that this project had. So the photo on the right shows uh, the, the bracing or struts out in front, and they've removed those where the complete ring is. And on the left of that, you can barely see some blocking that was placed. That was designed by us as well. Uh, to be able to allow them to advance the new structure without bulkheading and backgrouting too often. And then this next picture, this is my favorite, uh, shows the guy cutting the invert on the, the left. And on the right, I'm standing, I'm sitting in the new pipe arch, and you can see how deep we are uh, cutting and removing the invert. So that project, they uh, again, it, it was in the millions on what it saved. It, it was three and a half to four million dollars on what it saved. It was done as an emergency declaration project, which means a bridge engineer that was at the top of the list was was invited to participate and solve the problem. They did, and that particular uh, consultant, Ar Arborio, is the name of them. I'm sorry, contractor, Arborio Corporation, they had never done a tunnel liner plate job, nor had they done a reline job. And we were able to walk them through the process, and, and uh, they were quite comfortable with it. So we are uh, at 42 minutes in. As a quick review of the seven items, and then we'll talk about some uh, follow-up information that is available, and then we'll take questions. Uh, the seven things that we tried to convey today are the are critical design and construction uh, decision points. Assessment of the host structure, a reminder, you've got to get inside and you've got to understand what you're looking at. Number two, hydraulics. You've got to run the hydraulics and you've got to use a program that will look at inlet control and outlet control. You can't just slip line it with something smooth and hope everything is okay. I've actually seen a DOT uh, bid a project on a 72-inch culvert reline job, and there was a, a letter from the DEP that said, yes, you can reline this, but just make sure it's smooth to optimize hydraulics. When in, in the drainage permit, it showed that it was flowing in inlet control in the HY8 run. So smoothness had nothing to do with it. The downside was they took the ve velocity from 17 feet per second design velocity up to 27 feet per second, and they didn't need to do that. Uh, so you've got to look at the hydraulics. Structural design, until Ashto comes out with some methods that they are working on, it's smart to just assume the new structure carries the full load. Uh, design for durability on the material selection. Don't forget about CMP. Today's CMP products are much more durable than bituminous coated or galvanized CMP. Um, you've got to look at the constructability, not just of the product, but at the site and what those constraints are as well. Uh, you've got to look at grouting, and that really becomes a methodology review during the construction process. Uh, and finally, plans and specifications. That submittal list is critical, uh, but providing as much information you can as you can about the shape of the structure uh, is directly proportional to how economical your bids will be. So, uh, Contec, we have again we have 120 feet on the street plus all of their support folks. 
uh, we stand ready to help you uh, look at these structures, uh, assess them, propose options, etc. I encourage you to take advantage of that. That was the commercial. Sorry about that. Uh, for more resources, our website has some really good rehab and retrofit uh, information on it, as well as some case studies. The North American Society for Trenchless Technology website also has some great documents on it. NASTT.org, I believe, is their website. And uh, take full advantage. So, Lisa, did we get any questions that came in? Oh, yes. We do have some questions. Are you ready for them? And they're yes. still coming in. Okay. All right. So, let's go back to the very beginning. We were discussing hydraulics. As a result of relining, how much of the hydraulic capacity is admissible? How much is admissible? That, uh, I, I assume what he means there is how much can you get rid of. Uh, that depends on each site. In, you know, you've got to do a hydraulic analysis to see where the end conditions headwater depth is and what the outlet velocity is, and then you've got to manage that. On the inlet end, uh, a lot of times the, the review agencies will say, well, you can't increase the headwater depth. Well, I've seen that from a review agency when there was 10 feet available where it didn't have an impact on anything. So, you know, don't always accept their patent answer, uh, but instead look, apply the answer to your site and then argue the case for it. If you're increasing two feet, but you, your inlet condition is basically a pit, or a pond uh, with very tall uh, embankments all around it, then it's okay, in my view. <laughs> Great. What else? Oh, now, now the questions are rolling in. Um, have any of these lining projects been completed for culverts under railroads, and were there any special considerations? Yes, we've done a lot of relining under railroads. The railroads are uh, terrific about uh, effective use of their maintenance dollars. So they all often look at reline. In fact, they're in the midst of replacing a lot of wooden structures with drainage uh, structures and then filling it in. Uh, but the special considerations are access. You've got to look at the unique access situations where the culverts might be located. You've also got to look at the much higher live load. So if they're shallow and will feel the, the E80 live load pressures, you've got to design for that. And, uh, and you also should consider vibration uh, if they're within uh, that live load zone. Great. Okay, I have a few questions about um, lining options. Uh, what lining options are available for pipes that have curves in the that's, plan and they're not a straight tube? That's a great question. Uh, CIPP can handle curves quite well. Uh, segmental slip liner products, uh, some can if, they, if you can get short segments and you have enough room to manage that and it's a simple geometry uh, layout challenge. Uh, SPRPE, the spiral wound polyethylene product that we have, can handle curves down to about a 50 foot radius. Um, uh, but that definitely enters a higher degree of challenge as far as what will fit. Okay, um, and then if using a plastic pipe for a culvert liner, do you have any guidance on grout specifications to fill the space? Uh, are there special precautions that are different for HDPE versus PVC? Uh, there really aren't. The grout mix designs that we typically see uh, and, and the amount of space allows uh, really results in a, a low amount of heat being generated during the hydration of the cement. Um, a couple of options, if you have a smaller uh, PVC uh, reline pipe, for example, and you've got, for whatever reason, you've got a massive amount of concrete grout or cement-based grout, you can uh, put cool water in the, in the uh, reline pipe, plug it up and pump cool water in it to help with the dispersion of heat. But generally, mm -hmm. if you're talking about 12 inches or less, it just doesn't generate a lot of heat, and the ground will absorb it, and, and the air uh, 
inside the new pipe will absorb it. Great. Um, and then speaking of grouting, will the new pipe shift and rise during grouting, and how is the pipe braced to prevent this? Okay, great question. And we looked at a couple of slides that hinted at some options. Uh, but yes, buoyancy is a real thing. If you've got a grout fluid, fluid unit weight of, say, 45 pounds per cubic foot, and you're uh, grouting a, a round pipe, basically that pipe volume times that 45 pound per cubic foot is what the buoyant force is that you're dealing with. So you've either got to design it such that it can float to the crown, or you've got to, the contractor's got to come up with a way to hold it down. That can be by filling the new pipe with water. Uh, if it's small, if it's big enough you, to get in it, you can use uh, floor jacks, which are basically, basically basement jacks that are very cost effective and spreader beams along the floor to, to take uh, those forces. Great. Um, uh, I do have one. You talked about that list of contractor submittal items. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us where that list came from? Yes, that came from uh, an I-95 Connecticut DOT project and it was actually generated by STV engineers. And uh, I believe we have that in a, in a Word document on our website. Okay, if good. not, they can download a PDF of this presentation and it would be there. Or ask a contact person for it. Okay. Um, the next question is for me, actually. Can you provide a copy of the PowerPoint? We do have a copy of the PowerPoint, a six-blocker slide, um, under the Handouts tab of the GoToWebinar panel. So if you want to maximize your window, if you have um, minimized it for the presentation, if you go to Handouts, there should be one of five. Um, contact Reline at Webinar 419.17. It's a PDF. So go ahead and download it. I've gotten multiple questions on that. So um, just so you know, we did put that out there for you guys. And then, okay, next one moving on. I like this one. What pipelining methods minimize temporary stream and wetland impacts? Temporary. Wow, that's a great question. Uh, what reline options minimize temporary stream and wetlands mm -hmm. impact? impact. Okay, uh, bypass pumping is a great thing to control any uh, wetlands impacts upstream. Uh, it can create some challenges downstream. So really it's more, it's not necessarily a product uh, uh, issue, but a process issue or procedure issue. And they've just got to look at those things. Uh, if they, if you're using CIPP, for example, uh, UV curing is a good thing, but the standard CIPP processes release styrene uh, in the curing uh, water or steam, so that's got to be captured. That's uh, there have been some major fish kills of, as a result of styrene being released. Um, grouting, you know, some some environmental uh, uh, regulations limit the uh, the uh, spilling of grout in the stream and of course that can be monitored and collected uh, prior to exiting the structure downstream. Um, I've seen uh, sediment bags be used to uh, in the bypass pumping process to make sure that uh, any unusual amount of sediment doesn't get released or anything bigger than a certain size for the bag. Um, and that's really about all I can contribute. I'm not an expert on that area. I think that's good. Um, what, moving on to another environmental question, what are the typical permitting or environmental concerns related to relining? Uh, most of the concerns that way in the permitting process are hydra hydraulic capacity and the impact upstream. Uh, the, the increasing the headwater depth can have a big social and environmental impact. So you've got to, again, you've got to run the hydraulics and look at that and then look at your topo maps to see uh, what impact any increase or change in headwater depth is going to have. 
and don't forget the outlet velocity as well because you don't want to create a big erosion problem downstream because you bumped up the, the outlet velocity. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, a few more. They're, they're coming in so fast. What are the typical strengths of grouting and where can we find this information? Okay, the normal strength requirement for cellular grout is either 200 PSI or 300 PSI. And as I mentioned, uh, in a fairly deep situation, a 200 PSI grout uh, gives you a big sa safety factor. Um, mm -hmm. There's a company called Erix Industries, and I believe their website is Erix, and it's spelled A-E-R-I-X industries.com. They uh, actually provide us with the uh, Merlecrete filler that we use in Trust Pipe, which is a sanitary sewer pipe with a uh, some, uh, basically a, a cement-based uh, uh, filler material in the pipe wall. They make the foaming agents, and they're the leader with that. Elastazel is another company that makes a foaming agent, and those folks have specifications. Your contact representative can also provide you specifications. Uh, some of the DOTs have developed reline grout specs. Uh, many have not, and they they just use they have some base requirements, but they let the contractor submit for approval, and we can give you some examples of those. Uh, now, are there alternatives to using foam grout if the contractor doesn't want to use it or claims they can't get in the area? And then, are there limits on the length of culvert where it can be used? Yes, great question. Uh, we hear a number of 200 feet as the pumping distance for cellular grout. It really all depends on on the consistency uh, and how runny it is. Um, the you know if it's much more like shaving cream, that limit up is less than 50 feet. <clears throat> but the options are standard cement-based grouts, and uh, fly ash is often a component of those. The New York State DOT developed a mix design that was extremely cost-effective and uh, very versatile. It provided overkill on the compressive strength, but it was, it was cheap and accessible, and it basically just used cement, sand, fly ash, and water. And uh, I don't know if it's on their website, but we can, we can get you that. But any cement-based grout is applicable. Um, but again, it's it's not a structural concrete. It doesn't need to be high strength. Got it. Um, and then we have maybe time for one more. And I think this one, I think this one's pretty good. When is it too late to do a reline project when the pipe walls are severely damaged? That's a great question. Before I answer that, Lisa, I, I do need to say that <clears throat> cellular grout may or may not be applicable and low strength grouts on the ends. If you're in a freeze-thaw zone or you're on the upstream end and anticipate debris and that kind of thing with impact, uh, a structural concrete is a good idea for the last one to two feet of the grout envelope on the ends. Okay. Uh, so next question, what was the question again? What was the, when is it too late to do a uh, reline project? Great question. Uh, it's too late when it starts to move. Uh, but depending on the methodology, there are other aspects. So if, you, if you're losing your invert and you're supporting backfill material, but it hasn't started to sh change shape, it could be that the worker activity inside of it causes it to begin to move. And we just had that happen on mm -hmm. a project near Baltimore. Uh, they, they were going to slip line it with a very cost-effective aluminized ultraflow product, and the workers were in there setting up the bypass or the... Uh, the coffer dam flow through a six inch PVC pipe down the middle and hanging the uh, they had to change it to a tunnel liner plate approach so that's the easy answer when it starts to move you know you're mm -hmm. approaching um, but it's not too late it just depends on what you're trying to do okay and Hugh do you have anything else to add before I close out the presentation because there have been a few questions come up regarding PDA certificates so I wanted to get those answered okay I tell you else. what Lisa the last time we did this we had a similar number of folks on it and it generated over a hundred questions I will personally answer every question that I didn't answer uh, through the email yeah we got system. a lot of those <laughs> and I 
assume you can capture all those questions, right? Yes, we, we will be capturing all of the questions that did not get answered today. I know we made through a lot, but there are so many people on the line. These uh, There are a lot, and they are very, very good questions. So Hugh will be personally contacting you. Um, at the close of this presentation, a new browser window should pop up on your screen with a survey about today's webinar. After you submit the survey, your responses will be manually processed, and you should receive a thank you for attending email within 24 hours with a link to download your PDH credit. Again, this process is manual, so it will not be immediately following the presentation. If you have any other questions or if you have not received your email within 24 hours, please contact info at contactes.com. Uh, we thank you for your time and hope you learned something today from our webinar and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Hugh. Thank you, Lisa.